Sec Hill. We're joined by our Senior Counsel for Global Affairs, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Secretary Pompeo, I want to jump right into There's a lot, so much news with China and, and at the international stage and our own security in the United States. But we had the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense announced yesterday that it was delaying a scheduled test of the Minuteman Three intercontinental ballistic missile because of Chinese aggression. I mean, it wasn't like they tried to hide why they were doing it. But what kind of message did the China? Uh, Nancy Pelosi is back. That trip is over, and yet the ramp up continues to a point where our own military is not testing its equipment. The Chinese must love this. Goodness, Jordan. The uh, rule rule one: if you have a scheduled activity and the bad guys tell you not to do it and you don't bad guys win uh and and it's not about this test you can do the test a week from now or a month from now um it's about the message being sent uh message being sent to the chinese communist party that says you can bully the united states you continue to push and prod and diminish our country it's a message you're sending frankly to the american people that says you don't have confidence in the united states capacity not just military capacity but economic and diplomatic and then finally uh, right to to our allies around the world. If you're the Australians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, and the United States backs off in the face of a statement from the Chinese Communist Party, when we next ask you to do something hard to help us confront the Chinese Communist Party, protect freedom and prosperity for us, for America, our allies are going to see that we are not strong, we are not resolved, and we're not committed to being part of a coalition that will ultimately push back against Xi Jinping and this Chinese Communist Party. You know, Mike, I, th- I think about when when you were serving as Secretary of State, Russia was not invading Ukraine, and China wasn't ra- saber rattling as it relates to Taiwan. I mean, they've always had the 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 view of this one the one China policy and all of that. So now we've got China on, increasing, as Jordan said, its military exercises around Taiwan. And is it not is it conceivable that they would invade the Chinese it's government, the Chinese you. Party? Sure. Sure. It's, it's absolutely conceivable. Um, look, they have said they're going to do what they call reunification peacefully, but it doesn't look very peaceful to me today. And this is, this is the larger point, Jay, that I think you were getting to. President Reagan understood peace through strength. He understood that the, the bad guys understand only power. They don't understand words. They don't understand nuance. They understand power and demonstrations of resolve and clarity and transparency, the things that we modeled for four years. And when we did that, we were pretty darn successful at keeping these regimes from putting Americans at risk. And when you're not, when you when you say that a minor incursion into Ukraine might be okay, when yeah. you withdraw Americans, withdraw Americans from Afghanistan and get 13 killed and leave a bunch behind, whether it's Chairman Kim in North Korea or Xi Jinping in China or the Ayatollah in Iran, they are going to become more aggressive and present greater risk to the United States. Benjamin Disraeli, I'm going to pick up on that power statement for a second, famously said, and I've said it off in this broadcast, and he was dealing then with a conflict with, guess who, Russia, Turkey, was a whole, it was called the, the Eastern question. He said, diplomacy can be war, because if diplomacy backed with power sends that kind of message. Jordan, go ahead. Yeah, so we saw uh, Secretary Pompeo, Speaker Pelosi, she's been very upfront. She said, we're going to stay with Taiwan. We're not going to let China isolate Taiwan. Doesn't seem like that's the message from the Biden administration. And I listen. I know that every no one wants a war with China. I mean, no one. We're not. No, because there's so many issues uh, that we can raise there. But it, even inside the Democratic Party, it seems to be that there's a rift between where the Biden administration is and where the Speaker of the House is. Jordan, it's absolutely clear, and it's not just clear to you and to Jay and to me. It's clear to the Chinese Communist Party too to get to. Your earlier question, yeah, that increases the risk that the Chinese will see an opportunity to conduct a military action against Taiwan. It's um, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty straightforward proposition. Just really had this right. I, as, I was America's most senior diplomat for a thousand days. Without both the capability to defend America and a president who was prepared to do it, that is, right, the will and the capability, then the, the bad guys win because they will constantly push. They don't value human life. They don't think about the world the same way we do. Uh, they, they want to undermine the United States of America, that great beacon of freedom for the entire world. And they know that if they can take that down, if they can destroy our institutions within and prod and push abroad, then America will be less of a challenge for them to confront. And they can get what Xi Jinping ultimately wants, which is 
the capacity to, to, dom- to dominate the world in important ways for the next hundred years. You know, we've talked about the threat of China with you on this broadcast often. You've written about it at ACLJ.org. You tweeted yesterday, let me be clear, China under the rule of the CCP is the greatest threat to the U.S. in our history. It touches every facet of American life, military, education, private sector, government, and more. And that's all true. So we've got to offer, I always like to offer our audience hope, and positions that would make sense. What would you do if you were in charge to stop this threat from China? How do you reduce it from being the greatest threat to the United States in our history? We, we began this, and we still had a lot of work to do when we left office, Jay, but we began this. It began with communicating clearly to the Chinese Communist Party that we weren't a nation in decline. So that means fixing our schools, all the things here at home, right, prosecuting criminals, a strong America at home, gives us the capacity to push back against the Chinese. Second, you know, they built their country on the backs of American workers. They destroyed tens of millions of American jobs by stealing our intellectual property and manufacturing it all in China. You, you've got to stop that. You've got to reverse it. We can do that. It's not impossible to do. They're not 10 feet tall. We, we can prevail in this. And then you, you have to build your military. You have to build your capabilities and make friends in the region. We did each of those things. We were strong. We put our military back on its front foot. And if we get those right, the Chinese Communist Party will see that a strong America is going to be too much for them, and they'll begin to behave in ways that are just fundamentally different than what we're seeing in the news every morning. No, we haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. I wanted to ask you about Afghanistan. The, the, we saw the CIA, and we said that's great that they were able to eliminate al-Zawahiri, uh, leader of al-Qaeda. Uh, but there was so much concern in the U.S. immediately uh, that he was in Kabul, being put up in a in in a an apartment by a cabinet member of the Taliban government, and while the Taliban is still asking the world to do all these items, so the fact that he was comfortable in Kabul should it be as uh, as scary as this to America that you know the leader of Al Qaeda feel like he could waltz back into uh, Kabul and be at the home of a Taliban leader yet again, and we see the Taliban harboring someone that they know the U.S. is hunting. So it was a great strike, well done for the intelligence community, literally decades of work. It was being worked on before me. It was being worked on my time as CIA director, and then these folks finished it, good on them. Zawahiri was no longer operationally important, but he was an important target because he was at the center of killing Americans at 9-11. But what you mentioned, Jordan, is real. Uh, the, the fact that he was in Kabul in the center city, uh, not in Tora Bora, not in some far-flung place, and felt comfortable walking around there suggests that the Taliban continue to violate the most fundamental parts of the Doha Agreement. They did it on our watch. When they did it on our watch, Jordan, we went and killed a bunch of them. Um, you, you, you have to make sure that if they're violating the agreement, you come right back at them hard. And this administration just watches and violates this, these, these central things. And it is going to mean an increased risk of terror in the homeland if we don't put the gas on and put it back in front, making clear to the Taliban this is unacceptable. You have to change. And when they don't, which would be my expectation, there's no reason to think the Taliban are going to change their colors. Right. And when they don't, you have to apply pressure to them. All right, let me last question here, Mike, and that is this. We've got the conflict in Russia with Ukraine. We've got China saber-rattling. We have unrest, you know, serious unrest in the in the country, but, but globally too. My concern here is that the administration is just reactionary and is never proactive. And that, to me, causes real concern for our national security, whether it's the border or anything else. Jay, we talked about this not only in the context of the border, but in the context of Iran as well, right? right. Uh, our Israeli friends can see that we're no longer on our front foot. We're no longer playing offense. We're allowing the Ayatollah to dictate the terms of how we engage in the Middle East as well. And so for each of those areas, it is important. When the Chinese saber rattle. We should acknowledge their stable rattling and come back over the top. If we do that, if we do that well, we will decrease the risk of war. To your point, Jordan, nobody wants to fight the Chinese Communist Party. Nobody wants to be engaged in conflict with Putin. But if you are weak, you will beget the very kinds of conflicts that, it, that we aim to try and avoid every day. Secretary Pompeo, as always, we appreciate you joining our broadcast with this insight to China, to Afghanistan, to the Middle East.